So Judge Fitzpatrick, welcome to Constitutional Chats. We are so happy to have you, and we were hoping you might start with just a few minutes of opening comments uh, about the local court system. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be with you all today. Um, so the court system here in Texas uh, consists of, we have the municipal courts and uh, the municipal courts are, there are about 950 of those here in Texas. They have um, exclusive uh, jurisdiction over the uh, municipal ordinance criminal cases. And so that's your traffic tickets and your uh, nuisance type laws. Um, they also um, handle uh, limited like civil jurisdiction and they have some magistrate uh, functions. And then we have the justice courts in, Tar in Texas. We have about 800 of those. They handle um, suits between people of not more than $20,000. They um, handle small claims and criminal misdemeanors punishable by fine only. And then go to our county level courts. Those are the courts. There are about 528 of those. They handle probate matters like your wills and uh, when somebody needs a guardianship. Uh, we also have uh, statutory county courts. There are about 91 of those in Texas and those handle uh, like jurisdiction between 200 and 250,000. So those are suits that are between the, that amount. And then we go up to the district courts of where I'm at. We have about 483 of those in Texas and those handle actions between people that are $200 up to many, many millions of dollars. They also handle felony criminal matters. And um, depending on the type of court, the, the type of district court it is. So we have criminal district courts and civil district courts. Uh, criminal ones obviously handle the kinds of cases like murder and robbery and, and those types of cases. And um, civil courts handle ones involving money you also have family district courts that handle cases like divorce and uh, adoption, those types of matters. And then we go up to the Court of Appeals, and there are about 14 of those in the state of Texas, and they basically grade the uh, orders of the civil courts. And so um, in the criminal courts, they basically grade, grade the work that we do. And then the Supreme Court, we have nine justices in Texas. And the Supreme Court uh, is the final jurisdiction in civil and juvenile cases. And then we also have the Court of Criminal Appeals. There's only, again, one of those, it's nine justices and they are the final say in criminal cases. And so that's all the different types of courts we have here in Texas. Is that what you're looking for, I hope? Yeah, wow. Uh, can y'all hear me? Yeah, you can hear me, right? Uh, Kathy, did you wanna, did you wanna, yeah. Okay. She wants to. Uh, well, first of all, Judge Fitzpatrick, I think you should just be a little more accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> you have accomplished. I don't think I can match you with your your singing and ranching and everything that you have. Oh uh, no, no, you you've topped me actually. All that you do and you have accomplished, and all the, the, the being a mayor and a president of all these organizations and raising two children, um, I'm very very impressed. So. Did, yeah. Wasn't one of them mayor of mayor of uh, the gardens? Tell, tell me exactly where that was. Yeah, mayor of Dal Worthington Gardens, which is really yeah. near Arlington. I think it's uh, our friend Dolores Pell lives in Dal Worthington Gardens. I'm from, I'm from you know Texas, so uh, Euless and Colleyville, the, the entire area uh, there. So do you see Euless got the top city to live in in the state of Texas? You listed? You're kidding. Yeah, I know. It's surprising. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wait, this, this year? Was not that it's not year? a great city. I just was surprised to see that. I think it's because of the, they said, you know, the uh, proximity to the airport and the job market and uh, all that they have going on there. You know, it's grown quite a bit in the last few years. Yes. Oh, when I lived in Euless was 1965. So we can all just imagine. Yeah, it's changed probably a lot since then. <laughs> the DFW airport wasn't even there yet. Anyway, I'm very impressed with all of your accomplishments and to, to be a wife and to raise children at the same time. Truly, thank you for your, your commitment. And um, my daughter wants to follow in your footsteps, but she wants to be a judge as well. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to talk to her anytime. Yeah. And judges, you know, it's really interesting because you have to be so incredibly impartial. So I'm interested about the courts, but I'm also really interested in, in the assessment of when, you, when you're when you all the information. I think we've, you know, we've, we've been doing this entire series for our, um, 
for our study here on constitutional chats about the court system. And it's just always amazing to me how much knowledge you have to have in your head as, as, a, as a judge to be able to make these decisions. And it's, I'm very impressed. I mean, I, I think when, when, you're, when you're a lawyer, you have to know a lot, of course, when you're a trial lawyer to, to represent your client, but a judge, you've got to just, you just have to have, uh, uh, to be impartial and to have all kinds of, uh, you, you probably are really great at Trivial Pursuit. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends on the edition. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so, um, wow, that's just like a lot of courts. <laughs> it is a lot of courts, it is. And is that because it's, I guess this happens in every state they have, and, and, and the division of the courts is really interesting to me. And I, I would be so confused as to where to even go or how to find the information about where to go. But I suppose that's why you have a lawyer and they know where to go. Uh, it, but it that's is, just it a is lot confusing. of different courts. Yeah, I think, I think people who don't have lawyers, they're especially confused on how to navigate the system. But I mean, basically it's the difference between the type of matter it is. They have it separated by, you know, whether it's, family or probate or criminal or civil. I mean, that's really the four basic ways they're split. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Yeah, it, it just, it, and then gosh, and, and it, it feeds into an appeals court, one particular. Right. right, so you start at the baby court. We I always call it the, you know, justice of the peace and, and those judges, they're elected. Um, some, and one interesting fact about justice courts is that the judges of those courts don't even have to be lawyers really right and that's in some ways you know it's justice courts have the exclusive jurisdiction over evictions and so um you know that that's interesting you know depending on who's elected there uh how, how that goes but yeah there for instance in tarrant county um several of our justice of the peace or former police officers um you know it you don't have to be a lawyer so Talk about justice of the peace, because my mind immediately goes to a Western and to the sheriff, you know, it was the difference uh, between the sheriff and the justice of the peace. Yeah, they really don't have any, they, it, they really don't have anything to do with each other. So the justice courts basically are what you, um, not like Judge Judy. I mean, I, I, it's really nothing like Judge Judy, but it's that those types of small matters, you matters that aren't going to exceed $20,000. So that's where you're going to get a lot of your neighbor disputes, you know, um, anything where somebody has, you know, let's say you hit someone's car and it, you know, it's a, a ding on the door or whatever, and you want to sue someone for that. Um, you know, they see, they see all the smaller matters under 20,000 and you, but you don't have to file in justice court. So let's say you wanted to sue someone for $5,000. You could file that technically in justice court, county court or district court. But a lot of times people who don't have lawyers, they'll use the justice court because that's where, you know, pro se people normally file. So pro se means you don't have a lawyer. And so that those types of courts really um, are good for pro se people because they're easy to navigate as far as how you introduce your evidence. In county court and district court, there are a lot more rules that people have to follow. But in justice courts, the judges are able to um, help develop the evidence and ask questions and whatnot. And then also the justice courts do things like um, true, uh, uh, when people don't go to school, the truancy cases. Uh, like I said, they also handle all the eviction cases. So a justice of the peace, there's one in, in per county or one per court or- It's pre by precinct. So the state of Texas is split up by precincts and each precinct has their own justice of the peace. And so- if you just told me this, I'm a really bad student, and I think you did, but you kind of you kind of fed it into the court. What? But so, sorry if I zoned out, if I didn't get it. But what does the justice of peace actually do? The, like the the person is the is the justice of the peace elected or appointed? Okay, so justices are elected. So there are so many precincts in each county. Mm -hmm. County is split up by precincts, and then there is a justice elected for each precinct, and that justice, the they sit, they preside over the cases. So when somebody comes in, for instance, and wants to evict someone, the justice would hear the case and then decide if the eviction was handled properly and either, you know, rule in favor or against the eviction. Or let's say I wanted to sue my neighbor because, you know, they did something to my fence. I would sue them and the justice would preside over that case. Now they can have jury trials as well in the justice courts. Um, and so the judge would preside over the case, just like I would in a district court. Mm -hmm. But 
it's a different, um, like I said, their, their jurisdiction only goes to 20,000 and they're automatically appealable. Meaning if you're not happy with the decision, they're automatically appealable to the county level court. And then that judge there, you know, they're required to be, um, a lawyer and then they would kind of start over and see if the case was handled properly. That's what's so amazing. We, we were comparing that in another show about the difference between a king, you know, a king would just make a decision and that was it. And, and in our system, you can appeal, you know, if you don't like the right. decision. So, so, and I'm so naive. I know nothing about this. So uh, this is kind of cool, but we have precinct, mm -hmm. then you have county. Right. And then you have district. Right. Okay. In some, in some cities or in some counties where it's a small, like for instance, in Denton, right? Where they don't have as many people, you see the judge, like the judge like me that would handle family, criminal and civil all in one court. In Tarrant County or Harris County or Bear County, the bigger ones like that, um, you'll see where Travis County will be split up. So where you'll have a judge over just family law, a judge over just criminal and a judge judge over um, civil. And then depending on how many people live there, you know, for instance, in Tarrant County, we have 10 civil judges that pr that preside over district uh, court matters. And so we have 10 district judges. That's, that's how many cases that we do. And you're all elected and civil. And then we have our family ones and we have our criminal ones. And everybody's elected. Correct. Elected. At okay. The district court level and the county court level, they're all elected. Okay. Wow. Um, I'll, I'll toss it to Tova and I'll just, uh, to me, it, it's so fascinating justice, right? And mm -hmm. for people to be able to hear their, their, their grievances and for both sides to be represented. And I love history. You know, if you go back to the Hammurabi, oh, yeah. you know, Stella Steely or Steel, Hammurabi Steel. But, but uh, if you go all the way back to, to where they, they, of course, those were just sort of, this is an eye for an eye type of thing. But, uh, but then Moses, you know, Moses was trying to take on every case. And then his, his uh, father-in-law came along and said, wait, you're, you're trying to do too much. Why don't you appoint people to help you make these decisions? But it was the first time I really thought about, wow, they were, you know, people were coming to him with these problems and he was trying to, to figure all that out. And then of course you have Kings and Queens and then they would do it, but where's, that's just kind of one man's uh, opinion. So I don't know. I, I'm really fascinated when you compare it to history, how wonderful the American court system is and um, mm -hmm. how we really, really strive for justice to to hear to. And if you don't are you can appeal if, if, if you're not happy with the decision and um, to a certain extent, of course. But we really do have a pretty fascinating court system. And I, mm -hmm. I, I love the way it's, you know, all the, everything I'm learning, the district, the precinct, the, the state, the, you know, the, all the different levels and feeds into different, it, it's, do you want to just comment on just how the, the how fabulous our courts are? <laughs> I mean, you're in it every day. I don't know if it feels fabulous to you or not, but. <laughs> it, it, it really is. I mean, that's one of my favorite, my favorite things about being a judge is um, being able to, um, you know, chat with the jurors and really get an idea of, you know, how they felt the, the trial went and, you know, how they, how they perceive evidence and, you know, what, what did they expect when they walked in versus what they encountered when they got here and, I mean, I, I love I love that part of it. I mean, I think that's really what sets the United States apart from from every other country is you know our our jury system here and um, you know the justice that people you know they may not always feel like they got justice, um, but you know it, it's definitely uh, I, I think better than any other country for sure. It's a it's a, a, a jury of your peers, and I think that's what's so uh, interesting too. A jury of your peers. Uh, okay, Tova. Thank you so much for being on. I'm just learning so much about this whole system. And one thing that I found really interesting is learning um, how many judge roles are elected. Mm -hmm. I Going into this, I just really didn't know. I kind of just assumed that, that they were all there since the dawn of time. Um, so I think it's really interesting. Um, and so how how does the election system for judges work in terms of running a campaign? Because as somebody who's like worked on political campaigns for like legislative positions, how is it different running a campaign for a judge? Do you have to be, you can't, can you take positions on issues if you're supposed to be, you know, in the campaign process when you're supposed to be an impartial judge or can you take donations? Like, how does that work? Okay, so judges um, are elected every four years in, at the district level and um, at the county level. And 
So what happens is you have to have so many years of experience. So they just passed in the legislature. Um, you have to be a, a lawyer for at least eight years um, for, run, for running on a district court. And then at the Court of Appeals, you have to be a lawyer for at least 10 years. And so you go down and you, just like the legislators that you work for, you go down and you file your um you know, uh, application to run and uh, you raise money, hopefully, and uh, that, you know, depending on where you run, you know, a, a district court race can be very expensive and, and the county level too, depending on how many people are in the county and how, and how contested it is. For instance, my race was over $300,000 when I ran. And so I, I'm not saying they're all that expensive, maybe some are more, but it is very expensive process. Um, you, you really should not as a judge, uh, there are a lot of rules that we're governed by uh, the Judicial Ethics Commission. Um, you know, we we have very strict rules. We're not allowed to endorse other candidates. We're not allowed to, um, you know, participate in in things that could uh, affect our impartiality in the courts. Uh, you know, there are obviously rules on social media and whatnot that we have to follow. And so, you're you're correct in the fact that, you know, we don't want to do anything that could uh, diminish our um, or, or appear that we're not impartial. And so uh, once, you know, we have a, uh, our election is just the same as the other legislators. So I ran, uh, my last campaign was in November and uh, I ran just at the top of the ticket with the president and everybody else. And um, thankfully I was elected and now my term is four years. And so I'll be up again in four years. And so yes, we, we collect donations and, um, you know, there are rules, there are a whole bunch of rules regarding that and when we collect and how we collect and how much we can collect just like um, for other people. And then, uh, you know, hopefully, like I said, hopefully once you uh, are elected, you know, it, it gets easier after that. <laughs> but you can, you know, it, it's uh, it's not in for judges to be uh, voted out uh, depending on, you know, what what's going on politically, the climate. And, you know, in other states, they, uh, the judges are appointed. Uh, it just depends on the state you live in. And so some people might prefer that system. You know, we, the state bar, I mean, the legislature actually looked at that a couple of years ago, I think maybe last year. And what, you know, the, the issue being is that, you know, is it, is it uh, good for judges to take donations? And, you know, does, does that affect their um, decision-making? And, you know, they, they looked at that. And then also, you know, when, when people are in and out of office by an election, you know, you lose a lot of years of wisdom of the judges and, um, and that's what happened in Harris County. Um, I was, you know, it's uh, a few years ago, you know, depending on what happens at the top of the ticket, you know, you could wipe out your entire judiciary, you know, at the same time. And that's, and so that they were, they were looking at that to see if that system should be changed here in Texas. Wow, that's, I mean, that's really fascinating. Um, and then I was wondering, do these elections usually have high turnout or do people just, um, is it just like a specialized group of people who are extra informed? No, it's it's a high turnout because like I said, we're we're at the same time as the president. So anybody that would vote in a presidential election is also voting on the judges. So when you go in to vote at the top of the ticket for your, you know, on the last election, it was, you know, the president and then the U.S., the senators, and then you go down to your Supreme Court, your Court of Appeals, it'll have your district court and your county and all of that on this. And so it's a, it's a very big ballot. And a lot of times it's confusing for people who um, are voting for judges because they really don't have any idea what the different courts do. They don't know who the judges are. And so it, it's hard for people to stay informed because, in, you know, for instance, in Tarrant County, there's just so many of us uh, for people to understand what we really do. Okay. And then um, do, do judges run with a party? Like, do you have to be associated with a party to run? Yeah, so you either run on the Republican, the Democrat, or I guess you could run as a maybe an independent. Um, most most all the judges either run on a Republican or a Democrat uh, platform. And then, sorry, forgive me if I'm naive, but yeah. what makes a judge like Republican or Democrat if the law is objective? Is there like what what does that mean in context? I mean, I, I can tell you what it means to run on a, a Republican, I mean, as what I did on my plat, I mean, on my platform and my beliefs is that obviously I'm, I don't give my beliefs on individual issues, but I, I do say that I follow the law. So you'll see people who are constitutional judges or people who, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of you'll activism. You'll see a lot of people complain about judicial activism and, uh, 
you know, that that's one thing that I don't do. I try very hard just to follow what the law says. And so what you want to see as a judge that will say, look, I'm not creating new law. That's for the legislature to do. I'm following the law as it's written. And that way, everybody can expect the same result when they come into the courtroom. Great, thank you. Um, and then kind of shifting topics. I actually, I'm in um, AP governmental or AP government um, in school, and we actually are on our judicial um, unit. So mm -hmm. it's very lucky for me. This is like taking the place of me studying for my test tomorrow. Um, <laughs> Was something I found really interesting is we were learning about um, common law mm -hmm. and how every state but Louisiana has a mm -hmm. common law tradition and Louisiana actually has a civil law tradition, which is different. So could you explain what what common law is um, versus civil law or other thoughts of, of law? Well, I think that Louisiana, I think, has a lot of like stuff they model after the French. It's they, they have their own ways of doing things there that's very different. You know, the common law comes from, uh, we, our, our system is uh, followed by England and that's really kind of the tradition of what they say the common law is. And so, you know, it, Louisiana is just, it's, it's, it's a different state. They just do it way different. <laughs> um, but what is, what is common law? What is, that's based off of precedent, right? Right. Cool. Um, and then, okay, I was also wondering about the, the jury system. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of courts have a jury and which don't, um, and how is that determined? So it depends on, uh, so there, there's a Supreme Court case, Duncan versus Louisiana, actually, that ruled that a jury trial is a constitutional right in all criminal cases where the penalty may exceed six months imprisonment. And so any, you'll see a jury in most all criminal cases, um, ones that are not punishable by fine only. So for instance, if it's like um, you get a ticket, uh, like technically a criminal ticket for speeding, those normally aren't punishable by, by uh, jail or imprisonment. And so those, you just have a fine. You don't really normally have a jury for that. On a case where, um, there's a chance that you could go to jail. You're you have a constitutional right to a jury. So, um, so in most all criminal cases, you're going to see a jury. Now, in in civil cases, you have a right to request a jury as well. And so, typically, the, you'll see juries in the justice courts, the county courts, and the district courts. All all of those in Texas have juries. Fascinating. Um, and then, well, could you talk about the difference between a criminal and a civil court? Yeah, so, criminal court. Um, is uh so the difference between criminal and civil is so civil is when you're going to sue someone for or an action to when you're trying to settle a dispute with a third party okay so you'll see cases that um, where somebody wants to sue for a uh, breach of contract or they sue for um, a car accident or they sue for uh, legal malpractice or medical malpractice or fraud i mean there's just so many different things that you can sue for in a civil court now technically family is under the same rules of civil procedure. So family law court, that, that would be where you do your adoptions, would be where you have your um, uh, you know, divorce, any where you're gonna try to terminate somebody's parental rights, those types of things. And then you also have um, uh, in the criminal courts, you have different levels. So in the county level, that's where you're gonna have your lower level offenses. And so those would be um, criminal matters that uh, you know, DWI typically, you know, uh, some levels of assault, those types of lower level cases. And then you go to the district level and that's where your like murder and your uh, robbery, burglary, those more, um, you know, serious types of matters. And so they're separated by, again, how serious the level of offense is. Great, thank you. Um, and then obviously the population of America and I'm sure Texas has increased by a lot over the mm -hmm. years. Um, so do the amount of judges or courts, uh, do they increase proportional to the population or do you just have to deal with more cases each year? Um, yeah, I mean, right. Typically, if it gets to be too many cases, um, you know, they'll they'll create a new spot for a new judge. So, for instance, in uh, Tarrant County, you know, they've, they've tried to get some more criminal courts. They just when they become too uh, backlogged or whatever, I know Denton just got a new court. So. Right now, I mean, I, I think for a while they would just try to distribute the cases and everybody just take on the extra work if they needed to. But, um, you know, 
it, it really just depends on the, the county. Uh, there, you know, in these smaller counties where the population is is sparse, you know, you'll see one judge over seven or eight counties. It's, you know, it's it's a little bit um, different than living in a big county. Okay, um, and then could you talk about the idea of bail? Because I know, in, at least in Chicago, it's been a kind of big controversy with some people thinking that, you know, people's bails aren't set high enough, so people are getting released right. too easily. Other people think it's the opposite. So what, what is the system of bail? What's the idea behind it? Um, and, and how did it develop? So the, the issue with bail is that when, you know, they didn't want people, the idea is, you know, we did, they didn't want people who couldn't afford to, to not bail out to be treated differently than people who could afford to bail out. And so the problem was you, it was, you know, there's a disparity between the people who would commit crimes and they could afford to, you know, bail out versus someone who, you know, you know, possibly more minorities as well that were stuck in jail because they just didn't have the money to get out. And so that's, that really is, was the problems behind why they changed the bail system. And so, you know, there is, there is a problem. I, I think across the United States, they see that, uh, you know, when people are released the, the way that they are being released right now in some in some instances where they come out and they reoffend and they reoffend and they reoffend and you know I, I know that everybody's looking at that to see you know what they what can be done to to fix what's going on but in Texas for instance I mean or in, in Tarrant County and I speak to I mean basically when somebody gets arrested they come over to a magistrate judge the magistrate judge looks at you know different factors how, what crime was committed? Do they have a previous history? You know, what's their economic situation? And then they assess a bail. And, um, you know, a lot of times people are released on their own recognizance, meaning they don't have to pay a bail. They're just released after they're processed and then they report to the court. And so long as they show up to court, you know, there's no issue. Um, the problem is if you have somebody that's a repeat offender that's constantly being released on their own recognizance and they go out and reoffend, you know, that's those cases that you're seeing in the news. All right, thank you so much. I'll pass it on to Kathy, but this was yeah. really fascinating. So thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Judge Fab Fitzpatrick. We're so happy to have you here with us today. And you know, I'm I'm here in Virginia. I live just down the road from Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. And I when before our program, I was looking up uh, to see if we had Justice of the Peace in Virginia. And I did a little research and it said that in 1974, we Virginia went to a system of magistrates mm -hmm. to replace justices of the peace and that magistrates in Virginia are judicial officers, but not necessarily judges. And mm -hmm. I was just curious um, if, first of all, if, if you know, has there ever been a movement in Texas to, to, to replace the justice of the peace uh, system and why a state might want to do that? Why do you, and, and I mean, if you don't know, I, I totally understand because it's we're Not, far from Texas here, but I was just curious about that. Actually, I was raised in Virginia. I don't, um, I, I don't, I don't, I've not heard of anything like that here in Texas. Um, I, I know the magistrate. So for instance, we have magistrate judges here. I mean, the only thing I could think is that, um, you know, maybe, maybe for efficiency purposes or maybe, you know, it costs less money to have it, to have it run that way. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure why they did it up there. I mean, I could see, you know, you know, the process of electing people and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it'd be hard for me to, to speculate on that. Okay. Um, I just thought that was interesting. And um, I also wanted to ask uh, about drug courts because you mm -hmm. hear a lot of states and, and localities now having something called drug court. And I was wondering, uh, do you have drug courts in, in Tarrant County or in Texas? And if so, what are they and how do they operate? So they do have them at different levels. Um, drug courts are diversion programs that help people who have a problem. Uh, if they follow certain guidelines, then they would avoid having a final conviction at the end of the case. And they're really great programs because, you know, when somebody has a drug problem, if you just arrest them and you send them to jail, you know, and you haven't really dealt with the addiction, they, they reoffend, And that's really the, the inspiration behind having a drug court. And they have the same type of programs for uh, mental health. Um, they also have the same programs for domestic violence. They have the same kinds of programs for veterans. And so there are all different kinds of programs that, you know, uh, 
that uh, really the district attorneys and, and prosecutors work on to help uh, people from reoffending. And they, they do the same thing in the municipal level. I know we talked about teen court and in municipal courts, you'll see a lot of teen courts. And what that is, is, you know, when you have a, a minor get, uh, for instance, a, let's say they get a possession to possession of marijuana or possession for paraphernalia or something like that. It's a program that allows those teens to um, avoid a final conviction if they follow through with certain guidelines as well. And so someone who is at a young age and possibly wouldn't want that on the record uh, going forward. And so that, that's another type of uh, diversion program. Okay. And then I also want to ask about county judges in Texas. Do county judges in Texas, I, I know you talked a little bit about some of the issues that they deal with in the in the county court, but do they also act as sort of uh, the chairman or the of the of the county commissioners? Do they have oh. other yeah, responsibilities? It's really confusing. Okay, so each county, and for, for instance, in Tarrant County, we have a county judge. That's not really a judge. It's not the same as a judge of a court. It's not a lawyer. And they don't preside over matters. Now, a county judge is basically the, the judge of the commissioner's court. The commissioners make decisions based, you know, for the county. And so those are elected positions as well. The county judge is elected. And, you know, they deal with a lot of things like, you know, the taxation of the county, the roads, the county hospital, the county, um, any county services that are provided, you know, and, and whatnot. And so that that is a very different type of judge even though it's called a judge it's not technically what you would think of as a judge that's what i thought and i, I know in virginia we have uh the board of supervisors we don't have county commissioners but they're equal in responsibility and we have the chairman of the board of supervisors so i think is sort of equal to the the county judge that you're talking about right the, the county judge has a lot of power you know for instance here in texas County judges work with the commissioners to, you know, all these mask mandates that have, have happened and um, things, you know, how COVID is, is handled in the county with regard to the businesses or whatever. So, I mean, it, it's just a, um, it, it's, it's similar, it's a similar title, but definitely not the same responsibilities. Okay. I, um, when I was a student at Texas A&M, I actually had gotten an internship with the county judge, Judge Holmgreen in Brazos County. And I ended up turning it down to go to work for Joe Barden, who was running for Congress for the first time. Oh, yeah. And I, I pretty Barton. much changed my life, I think, to end up working for Joe and going to D.C. Because I think if I had interned for the great, he was a good county judge, Judge Holmgreen of Brazos County, I probably would have ended up, I don't know what where I would have ended up. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just really interesting. And I've always been real interested ever since then in, in county judges and what they do. Um, but we've they got a lot of, great they have a lot of power. They're the top, you know, they, they have a lot of responsibility for the county. So, yeah. Well, we've got some great questions here from our listeners. Uh, Sandy Thatcher asks, how many areas of law are reserved exclusively for federal courts, such mm -hmm. as intellectual property, uh, copyrights, trademarks, patents, or trade secrets? So it's, so the federal the jurisdiction of the federal courts is normally a question of constitutional law. So that's why you see a lot of civil rights things go through there. Um, you see a lot of questions um, that have to do with abortion and or, or those types of those types of matters. That's why you see those things in the federal courts. They also um, have a jurisdiction over when two people from two different states sue each other. And so sometimes you'll have uh, somebody from Oklahoma versus Texas, you'll see those filed in the federal courts. You'll also see uh, cases involving, um, uh, you know, uh, like you said, anything that has to do with the violation of a federal act. So the, a lot of that uh, copyright and uh, intellectual property law, a lot of that is federal statutes. And so that's why you see those in the federal courts. Okay. And then John Chambers, uh, First of all, he had a comment. He said, we have drug courts in Oregon. I work with people in that system, very good alternative. And then he also asked, the Seventh Amendment says any case in controversy over $20 has to have a jury. How mm -hmm. do they get around that on a ticket of say $100? You, I think you can request juries in those cases when you, you can have a jury trial on those. Okay. In, well, in Texas, you can have a jury trial on those. Okay, very interesting. And then uh, Vincent Romano says judges have to be impartial. Um, 
what do you think about candidates for judgeships having to defend their political positions, specifically defending extremist defendants? I see a lot of this going on lately. Um, the best thing for judges is not to defend anything. I mean, I, when I, I mean, I have cases, I, I don't, you know, it's hard not to want to go and explain why you're doing what you're doing. Um, you know, you say that you try to follow the law as best you can, but you know, that's where you get in. I think to judicial activism, if at the point you are defending why you're doing something, you know, I, I think you're getting into that gray area where you probably shouldn't be. Okay. And then um, Sandy Thatcher has another question. He says, would discovering a right of privacy in the constitution as Justice Douglas did in the 1965 Griswold case as part of the penumbra of the law be considered judicial activism? Is there any counterpart to the penumbra that local courts might conceptualize? <laughs> That's a brainy question. <laughs> it is, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't understand exactly what he's asking. Um, yeah, I'm, I know he, he's real interested in what he's talking about, the penumbra of the law, um, but at any rate, um, and maybe he can write in and clarify a little bit more. Um, and then also just wanted- Is he, uh, is he talking maybe like the, right, the Bill of Rights? I mean, what, I'm not sure what he's, if he clarifies, I'd be happy to answer. Okay. Okay. Well, great. Well, Janine, do you, uh, do you have more questions? I do. I always do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those really annoying kids. Why? But why? But tell me why? But really why? Uh, I want to know more why. Um, okay. Just clarification. You said a, a, something really cool earlier that if it's going to require jail and there was something about six months, you're guaranteed a trial. Are you, tell me that again. That was um, the court case, uh, Dump, Duncan versus Louisiana. It was a Supreme Court case that ruled that a jury trial is constitutional right in all criminal cases in which the penalty may exceed six months imprisonment. Okay, so if, if it exceeds six months imprisonment, you're guaranteed a, a jury. That's, well, that, in that particular case, that's from 1968. Uh, so does that apply now in Texas? At least it always, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, in in Texas, you're in you're entitled to a jury trial if if the um, if you're looking at imprisonment of any kind, even under six months, right? Okay, and then, but you also can have a jury trial for anything over twenty dollars. Yeah, that's what I was. I, I would need to go back and clarify that. That um, I, I know, for instance, in well, in, you can have a jury trial for uh, any case filed in the justice court. So, I mean, I would imagine if it was twenty dollars, you'd still be entitled to it. Uh, so, you can ask for a jury for anything if you want to, essentially. In, in a justice court, yeah, in Texas, in a justice court, a county court, or a district court. Okay. Um, okay. Here comes another naive question. Since I don't know what is a magistrate, Kathy was talking about a magistrate in Virginia. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> So I you see, go ahead and say I'm an actress, right? I mean, I know a lot, but I don't know what magistrate means. So a magistrate <laughs> typically is a judge that is um, appointed uh, by. So, for instance, in Tarrant County, we have magistrate judges, and they do they do the bail processing for um, uh, the court. So when somebody gets arrested, they'll you'll go before a, typically a magistrate judge who will set your bond. And so a magistrate judge is basically, you know, a judge that's typically appointed, not, um, or hired. It's some, you know, like a, a, you'll see a lot of times magistrate judges that do uh, child support cases where they're dealing with AG and setting the amount of money for uh, what somebody owes in child support. And so it's kind of, it's not a helper judge, but it's kind of, kind of similar to that. And so what's Texas's counterpoint to that? We don't have magistrates, but we have. Yeah, we do have magistrate judges in Texas. So we have that's oh. what in Texas, like the magistrate judges in Tarrant County, they help set the bail for a lot of the criminal cases or they can sign warrants. They can sign. I mean, they, they have all kinds of different functions here in, in Texas. So what were you talking about with Kathy? Well, Kathy, you said, are we are Texas going to go to the magistrate system? Well, I was just looking at talking about in, in, Virginia, in, in Virginia in 1974, they got rid of the justices of the peace and they consolidated, I guess, the justice of the peace function under magistrates. And it says in Virginia that a, 
on the on the court system website of Virginia, a principal function of a magistrate is to provide an independent, unbiased review of complaints of criminal conduct brought by law enforcement or the general public. Magistrate duties include issuing various types of processes such as arrest warrants, summonses, search warrants, emergency protective orders, emergency custody orders, and certain okay. civil warrants. So, okay, but so what you're saying is we would get rid of our justice of the pieces for magistrates. Is, is that what the conversation was? Well, if that's where Virginia did. I think uh, Judge wow. Fitzpatrick is saying she hasn't heard of that of any movement of that type in Texas. Yeah, it's just, just, okay. Yeah, it's just as interesting how different states uh, design their local uh, mm -hmm. judicial systems in different ways. So in in, te in Texas, our magistrate judges are appointed by the district court. Like they're, they basically help the district court judges and they, they can do all kinds of duties. But a lot of times what you see is they kind of ha handle the minor, the minor offenses or they, um, or whatever, whatever the judges have assigned to them. So it's, it's, they're not elected, but they are, you know, they, they handle tasks for district judges. Okay. Thank you. Just a little clarification there. Sorry. Sorry if this just seems so. No, no, not at all. <laughs> so elementary, but when we have a lot of elementary and middle and high school kids. So it's kind of cool to be able to, to, to explain. And I'll, Tova, I'll come back to you in a second, but can you tell us what a day in the life um, I mean, uh, it's interesting to me that, I mean, did, are you nine to five? Do you, are you on your lunch hour? Do you, are, what, what is your daily life like, a day in the life? And then maybe you can tell us about your most complicated case or, uh, I mean, it's just, I would love to be a fly on the wall and watch you work. Uh, what is what is the day in the life for Judge Fitzpatrick? Well, it really depends on the judge. Um, the judges set their own uh, court hours typically. And so our, our court normally will start jury trials at eight in the morning, uh, eight, 830 in the morning. And we go till uh, five, 530, just depending on if we have a witness on the stand or not, um, depending on the week. So some weeks we have uh, jury trials. Uh, you know, the goal is to have a jury trial. We start one every Monday. And then typically the kind of case is, you know, if it's a, a complicated case, like a medical malpractice or something that involves, you know, uh, millions of dollars, those cases can go, you know, weeks long. And so we would be, you know, in the court with the jury and all the lawyers for every day for as long as the case takes to try. Now, most of the cases, you know, are week long or less trials. And so on the days that we don't have trial, we have hearings and hearings are the, the matters that arise before a case is set, like actually has a trial. So if a lawyer wanted to withdraw from a case, if a lawyer needed a continuance of a case, if the lawyer um, was asking for documents from the other side and they weren't providing what was requested, you know, we'll have a hearing and decide, you know, were they following the law and what they were supposed to be doing and providing the documents or not. So there are all kinds of little matters that are ruled on prior to a case actually getting a final um, disposition. So disposition is you know, is the case having a jury trial? Is it being settled? Is it being mediated? Is it, um, you know, is it having a bench trial? So there's two types of trials uh, that I do. One is where the parties come to me, I hear the evidence and I issue the ruling or the parties come to a trial and they uh, put on their evidence and the jury makes the decision. And so you can either have a jury trial or a bench trial and that, um, you know, that's really uh, the two different kinds. And then, like I said, on the days that we don't have trial, we we hear, uh, you know, all the other little matters that arise. So it's a, um, okay. it really depends, you know, I'm on my lunch hour now, but you know, we, we take our lunch whenever, uh, you know, it's the opportunity arises. So, I mean, we, we really don't have a set um, other than, other than we, you know, start at normally 8, 30, we end at five. There's really no other set times for anything. Well, thank you for taking your lunch hour to talk to us. I mean, that's just yeah, really course. nice. I, I appreciate that. And then, and then I'm trying to figure out how you raise children in the middle of all this, right? <laughs> that's hard to do. Having, I'm a single mom working mother and it was, uh, uh, it's hard, it's just hard to do. I, that's, you know, yeah, girl power, I guess, right? Uh, no, I'm, I'm sure I figure just like every other working mother, you know, it's uh, women have a, what do they say? If you want something done, ask a busy person. And that's, I bet that's uh I bet how a lot of busy moms get through. They, you know, they're just efficient with their time. Yeah. Yes. So true. So true. Okay. We're almost finished here. Tova though, I'll, I'll give it back to you. Sure. Um, could you talk more about the juvenile justice system? And sure. I know, was there always a, a separate system for uh, 
minors or just what that is and how it developed? So it depends on the county that you're in. Um, in Tarrant County, we have our juvenile courts that handle um, matters involving, you know, juveniles. It's it's really sad to see. You'll see a lot of crimes now committed by younger and younger people uh, when you watch the news. And so our juvenile district courts, I mean, they deal with children who murder, who rob, who, uh, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking, but, um, you know, that's, they really, they handle all the matters involving children. You know, there's a separate jail for children in Tarrant County. And so uh, it's, you know, it's the same functions. It just, the, the, you know, people are under 18. Are the penalties generally less for people under 18 or um, more lenient or not? It just, it just depends on, it just depends on the situation. You know, if it's, uh, you know, I know that the intent is to want to rehabilitate children. And so, you know, depending on the offense, you know, but if they're, they're being tried for murder or for, for whatever, I mean, it's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's different guidelines, different sentencing, depending on what the crime committed is. Okay, and did they, did there always used to be separate tracks or I, I think I remember in Chicago, it, I think they used to be tried like as adults back in the 1800s and then there was an effort to separate it. Is that true or? I'm um, sorry, I can't speak on that. I don't, um, I know here that if it's a child is almost, you know, 18, then sometimes they're tried as adults. That decision is made by the prosecutor, how they're trying them. And so, you know, I think again, it depends on, you know, each situation, I know they look at it to see, you know, is, is it, is a person a repeat offender, you know, how close are they to the age, you know, and whatnot. But I mean, I know the intent always is they want to rehabilitate children, you know, at that young age. Their dot a lot of times too, their kids, well, in all cases, their cases are sealed if they're, if they're trying the juvenile court system, meaning that, um, you know, they're, they're not open record like a uh, adult case would be. Great. Thank you. That was my question, Kathy. Do you have another one? Um, I think, I hate to say it, but I may currently be out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> this has been fascinating. Um, Janine? Um, well, okay. Uh, it, 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 tell me, tell me what's been your most, do, can you go into it? I don't know if you can talk about it. I mean, you, we, we see, we see courtrooms, you know, on television, like uh, LA Law or maybe LA Law. <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah, it was a while back. But all the you know all these law is it like that at all? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not anywhere near that exciting. Nobody like throws evidence across the courtroom or or. Uh, in fact, what's been really interesting to me as a judge coming from being a lawyer is how the juries interpret the evidence. You know, as a lawyer, when you're in the middle of a case, you're so close to it. Sometimes it's hard to be to to really be objective um, when you're when you're telling the story. And so to, to see how the juries interpret the evidence is really, really interesting. So for instance, I'll give you an example. They um, had a lady who was in an injury case and the jury, she wore high heels to court and the jury, you know, basically didn't think that she was that injured because how she walking around in high heels um, on the way to the witness stand. And so it's little things like that, that they pick up on you know, I'm one of those that if my back was hurting, I would suffer through and wear high heels anyway, because, right, I mean, that's, I, I don't have any flat shoes. I, I, I like to be in heels, but, you know, now knowing that juries, you know, interpret things like that, that's why you see lawyers a lot of times wear a lot of black and gray and navy, very conservative, you know, they don't wear a lot of jewelry. I mean, there's just, uh, it's, it's very interesting. I, I love um, to see the strategy that the lawyers put forth in the cases. You know, there's so many different ways to present evidence. And really a lot of that is just strategy, how, how you tell the story, how, what you decide to introduce as evidence. And, um, but, you know, typically what I've noticed that the juries, they do not like the, um, you know, a show. They, they like the lawyers to be, just talk and be straightforward, not to repeat themselves. And so the stuff that you see on TV where the lawyers become, kind of arrogant or sassy or, you know, uh, argumentative, they really hate that. The jury, I've, I've just noticed that the juries really hate that. And so I, I would go back and do a lot of things different if I go back into private practice. I think I've tried, you know, about a hundred jury trials since I've been on the bench, um, since I've been elected. And it's just, it's very interesting to talk to them after. We do a little survey 
after every jury trial and ask them, you know, what did you like about the way the evidence was presented? What did you not, you know, what, what can the court do better? Um, how did you like being a juror? And uh, I, it's just amazing the comments that we get back from that. And I use those cards to go teach the lawyers, hey, this is what the juries think of, of how you're presenting your case and what they think you should do better next time. That is really interesting because my daughter's in law school and, uh, and she's in this phase where she's thinking she wants to kind of, you know, look like, uh, you know, doll up a little bit, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And uh, I'll tell her this, I'll tell her this. And it, it reminds me of, um, it reminds me of an actress mm -hmm. because if you want to be a serious actress, you're taking on the character. Mm -hmm. So as, as a serious actress, you sort of take the makeup off, no fingernail polish, mm -hmm. you know, you wear black, uh, you, you do whatever you do because you're taking on the persona of, of, of another life. And it's not yours. So that's really, really interesting you, to me. You don't want the jury to focus on what you're wearing or what you are doing. And that's really why I think that, you know, it's best to wear those conservative colors. You know, they, they, you know, they say, you know, if, if the lawyer is wearing a lot of expensive jewelry or, you know, or, you know, you just, you just don't want them to focus on anything that you're doing. You want them to focus on the evidence of your case. And so the more argumentative you are, the more sassy you are, the more, you know, the more it's about you, that's them focused on what you're doing, not on them interpreting the evidence. And, and it's really, mm -hmm. it's very interesting. They focus a lot on, for, for whatever reason, the women's shoes. I think it's because they're so, a lot of times they're so bored, you know, they just look for anything in the courtroom to focus on. Um, and so they really, they really nitpick on things that I, I just didn't have any, I, I just expect them to come up with some of that stuff that they do. That's just really, really interesting to me because I, you know, serious actresses, you take off the jewelry. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't wear you don't wear dangly earrings or you take off the red lipstick and it, it, it's a it's kind of there's a parallel and I think the parallel I would make is is an actress walking into an audition would be like mm -hmm. the lawyer um I would love to be a producer a director watching all the actors come in mm -hmm. um to be on the other side of the audition because I'd be able to learn so much I'd probably relax a little uh <laughs> you know going into auditions it would be really fascinating to be on the other side of it I, I find that to be the like the best part, honestly, is is to be on this side and to see I, I see the very best lawyers. I mean, you have these huge, you know, law firms from Dallas and Houston and, you know, they, they come, I get lawyers from New York, you know, and like I said, I see the very best lawyers and I see I see on the opposite side as well. And so just seeing, you know, they're just how how they how they present the case, you know, how how what's their style? How do they do closing arguments? You know, how do they how do they tell the story? I mean, that's, that's all strategy and experience. And it's really fascinating to see it from this side. I mean, I definitely think um, this is, makes me a much better lawyer. Mm -hmm. Well, when my daughter was in debate, there were two types of debate and we'll close with this. Um, there were two types of debate. One was the Lincoln Douglas and the other mm -hmm. is the uh, public forum. Is that what it is? Do you know? I don't know. Public I did Lincoln Douglas when I was in school. Um, yeah. Lit Lincoln Douglas, forum. the most public forum, I guess. And the Lincoln Douglas, from a lawyer's perspective, was very kind of what you're talking about. Public forum is just like, you don't even have to know what you're talking about. Can you just convince the jury whether mm -hmm. it's true or not? You, you just have to win. You just have to be, you know, uh, uh, persuadable, um, which is, of course, not true justice at all. But it, it's kind of an exercise they do, which is which is really interesting. Because I was a, they asked me to be a judge. I didn't have, I didn't have a clue what I was judging. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, well, just just who do you think? What? And I'm like, OK, he was the most persuasive, I guess, and because I didn't really know what they were talking about. So presenting the story in a, in a proper manner is really important for the for the for the for the, for the plaintiff and the defendant. Is that right? Wait, yeah, and plaintiff and defendant. Or yeah. petitioner or respondent, depending on what court you're in. But I, I will say, I mean, that's why so many people, I, I think, you know, 99% of the cases really settle, you know, it, it's, they may file a lawsuit, but they work it, you know, they work it out before a trial is needed. And so really with mediation now and arbitration, we see so many fewer cases go to trial. And, you know, that's good for the plaintiff and the defendant, because there they have a, uh, a final outcome that they both had a part in. And while they may not be, you know, fully happy either side, they both have you know, a sure thing at the end, you know, when you go to a jury trial, you know, you have no idea what the jury's going to do, you know, you just have no idea what they're going to pick up on and, um, you know, or, or what they see and, and, uh, you know, you just don't have any control over the outcome like you would if you were to mediate or arbitrate your case. That is interesting. That is really, really interesting. The whole show has been interesting. You're fantastic. Thank, oh, thank you. you for Thank having you me. so much. 
thank you for taking your lunch hour to come speak with us and teach everyone who's watching today. It's been yeah. truly, truly informative. Well, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. All right. You take care. Thank you so well. much. Judge right. Patrick. Thanks, Patrick and Janine, I want to jump in and remind all of our listeners that today is Giving Tuesday. And Aubrey, if you'd like to bring up our website, uh, if you enjoy our Constitutional Chats programs and want to help us reach more students and more people across America with, our, with all the great Constitution education programs that we do, you can go right on our website and click right there to make your Giving Tuesday gift. We have got a goal that we are trying to reach, and I think we're at about 13% of that goal right now. And so we would love, be so appreciative of, of any contribution that you could make to help us reach our Giving Tuesday goal today. So thank Yeah, and I'll just, inter I'll just interject something that my mother uh, has proposed and, and does. If you would, we have these great new cards um, with our winner's artwork on the outside. If you would like to give a gift, uh, a donation, which would also could be a gift in memoriam in someone's name who you've lost or a gift, uh, a gift. Just have you ever received those gifts? Like your gift for Christmas is from the American Red Cross. A donation was made in your name to the American Red Cross. Well, you can do that too. You could say, give a Christmas gift. Um, and the donation can be to, to constituting America and to the founding father, you know, to preserving our, our nation's principles. Also uh, we have Christmas cards for sale. And proceeds of those donations go to um, America, go to Constitution America. There you go. And we also have a really cool George Washington t-shirt, which where's my t-shirt? Ah, uh, Santa, George Washington is Santa. So uh, you can find these on Etsy as well. Great Christmas gifts. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Tova. Thank you. Aubrey, and we thank our great guest, Judge for uh, uh, Fitzpatrick, and thank you for joining us today. And next week, we'll see, we have a great new series coming up. Next week, I think, is an overview of this, right, Kathy? Um, yeah, that takes us to the 15th. And after that, we're starting on America's economy. It's going to be the National Bank, the Federal Reserve, all those aspects of, of the economy throughout America. So that'll be really, really interesting. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.